The World Health Organization has named stress the health epidemic of the 21st century. Chronic stress has been linked with the leading causes of death, including heart disease. Research shows stress levels are only increasing. The question now arises, what factors influence our health? The safety of your physical environment? The strength and quality of your social connections? Perhaps your biological and genetic makeup? What about artificial intelligence? These factors that determine our health look very different 50,000 years ago on the savannas of Africa. Today, our lions not only travel by the speed of their leap, but by the speed of light. Our communities are becoming virtual. When making clinical predictions, our doctors no longer look up to patterns in the stars, but patterns in our medical data. The digitization of our environmental, social, and biological health determinants is creating an enormous amount of big data. While this has been going on for, for decades, clinicians are now partnering with computer scientists to utilize the computing power of artificial intelligence or AI algorithms to process big data sets for clinical insights and even treatment recommendations. But here's my concern. AI algorithms like deep neural networks are modeled after our own neural architecture. And like our human brain is shaped by daily experiences, these artificial neural networks are also shaped by our experiences, by our data, in this case, our medical data. If an AI is going to start making treatment recommendations, I want it to not only know about the biological, but the social and environmental factors that inform my health. For example, it can identify and diagnose stress and anxiety in college students, an epidemic across the UK and the US. But can it identify the environmental and social conditions that precipitated the onset? Unlike human intelligence, if not in the data set, AI cannot creatively adapt and generalize knowledge of how biological factors differ across diverse social and environmental contexts. Not to mention populations that can't afford health care or are geographically isolated. We should note that the same health inequalities and inequities that exist in patient data today will not be magically populated by AI, but may be perpetuated. How can we reduce these disparities in our health data? Right now, our data is segregated and regulated by health, consumer, and lifestyle economies. Data sharing between these economies typically don't occur. However, in a collaborative economy, consumers are able to acquire resources from each other instead of corporations. This encompasses space sharing like Airbnb. For example, if I rent out a room in my house, the value of that house increases for both myself, the homeowner, but also the person saving potentially hundreds of dollars in hotel fees. The premise is when information about goods and services are shared with the community, their value increases for the sharer and community. Can we extend the model of the collaborative economy to the model of collaborative health to help fill in the gaps in our health data? If I share my consumer health and lifestyle data with my community, the value of that data increases for both myself and the community. By digitally collecting our whole human experience, not just medical or consumer, we can reduce disparities in our health data. Just as we donate blood because we are donating our data, our collaborative challenges and triumphs can train AI algorithms to identify novel treatments. Collaborative health will take us beyond sharing tangible items to realizing the life-giving properties of sharing our data for not just the individual, but the population. In 1628, physician Dr. William Harvey said, life is in our blood. In 2016, physician Dr. Dan Kraft said, data donation will become the new blood donation. 
Indeed, this data will course through the veins of AI and that river of life where the health of one is linked to that of the whole. In this case, artificial intelligence is not that artificial. I am not a computer scientist. I am a doctoral student in counseling psychology at Boston University and a recent graduate of the Harvard School of Public Health. As a Bostonian, it might not come as a complete surprise that I have been in three significant car accidents in the past five years, resulting in a post-concussion syndrome and an overactive thyroid disorder. I use my own patient, consumer, and lifestyle data to assist in my recovery. After the first accident, I was diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, which is a mild traumatic brain injury. I became hypersensitive to my external environment. What sounded like a hurricane blowing past my window was a car traveling at a casual speed of 30 miles per hour. What looked like piercing, strobing lights was the morning sunlight dancing through the leaves. After the second accident, I was again diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, but my symptoms were a little different. While the hypersensitivity to my environment returned, I now had difficulty regulating my attention, energy, and mood. I became severely depressed. My doctor also informed me that because of the physical trauma, my body was releasing high levels of stress hormones like cortisol, resulting in hyperthyroidism, which means I would need to take a pill for the rest of my life to decrease my heart rate and metabolism. My body was responding this way for good reason. 50,000 years ago on the savannas of Africa, our body evolved to automatically or unconsciously regulate response to external threats. By the time we consciously think, oh my goodness, it's a lion, our body has already increased its own heart rate. Visual acuity and muscle tension preparing to fight, flee, or in extreme danger, freeze. But because of the repeated physical trauma, my body was misperceiving even non-threatening stimuli like passing cars as lions no longer on the savannas of Africa, but in Boston. At this point, I was forced to take a step back. From a psychophysiological perspective, I knew exactly what was happening to me, and I knew the long-term health implications. Beyond taking a pill, I needed an objective way to regulate and monitor my mind and body between doctor's visits in the real world and in real time. I am part of a generation that intuitively turns to technology for solutions. So naturally, I started experimenting with mobile technologies to track my physical and emotional stress in response to different environments, activities, even social interactions. Today, I no longer take a pill to regulate my heart rate and metabolism. I use a mobile app I created. I realized through my academic and life experiences that our health is a result of our biological, environmental, and social interactions. And then it dawned on me. Wouldn't it be interesting and helpful to know what situations were stressful and relaxing for other people? What if that data could be donated to hospitals and universities to connect the dots between the biological, social, and environmental factors that determine our health in the real world and in real time, where cures are crowdsourced? and the road to health is navigated together, collaboratively. After graduating from Harvard, I created an app called Biosay that got accepted to Harvard's innovation labs. For example, if I wanted to understand the degree to which public speaking induced stress, I would place my finger over the cell phone camera. The measure or biology would then begin to form. I would then add voice and facial analysis type a quick note, add a friend or two, and then post it. So others can view my experience on a map or augmented reality. Oh, and of course, I would donate my data to research hospitals and, ac and academic institutions. It is my hope that Biosay would be just one tool used to express our authentic experiences and share our data. While it is still a primitive tool, the algorithm used to interpret well-being is fairly young and it has a lot to learn. I hope you will join me in training the app through your own experiences. As Peter Diamandis said, our brain has not had a software upgrade in 50,000 years. We are hardwired to recognize threat before safety. 
But during times of stress, our body just doesn't release stress hormones like cortisol. It also releases oxytocin, which increases our desire to bond with others. In Darwin's Descent of Man, he mentions survival of the fittest three times. He mentions love over 40 times. We survived because of our humanity, our ability to collaborate. The collaborative economy has taught us that experiences and data are valued when they are shared. Mobile health technologies can assist individuals and populations to become aware of the environmental and social determinants that increase well-being. As AI begins to play a more active role in how we receive and access care, creating a new digital determinant of health, it is important for not just computer scientists, but clinicians, patients and policymakers to know that an algorithm is only as generalizable as the data it was trained on. What if we could train it together? Imagine a world where health is collaborative and wellness is crowdsourced, where we can identify the environmental and social factors that cause the illness based on our collaborative experiences in the real world and in real time, not just the hospital. My invitation to you today is to embrace the opportunity that this World Health epidemic offers whether we do so in real life conversations or through tools like BioSay, it is in our sharing and communicating of everyday experiences that we will thrive. While I am not here to speak on the soul, I do believe we are more than the sum of our parts. We are more complex than our data. The human experience is more complex than alike. If it takes a village to raise a child, it will take the world to train a doctor AI and when it has learned from the majority and the minority, from people in remote regions and faraway lands, from those who pray from freedom of a disease or disaster's reign, from those who have finally found peace in the heavens or who have learned to be that change, then once upon a time, collaboratively, we will heal each other and we will see that change. We began our journey today in Africa, and in honor of our theme beginning, I would like to end with the word Ubuntu, which has many translations, none of which I will do justice, but I will leave you with one. I am because you are. Thank you. <laughs>